Hi everyone, my name is Hera and I will be talking to you about how do we investigate contracts using open contracting. So this slide deck that you see in front of you, which I will be taking you through, is made specifically for investigative journalists. We do this a lot and um, it's to, to show you common ways of spotting red flags and how to use public procurement data to tell stories about public spending. And the slide deck is actually a primer. So you will see that there's, you know, use the link that you have for these slides and in the speaker notes, you will find a lot of information. So exactly. So use the hyperlinks for more information, read the speaker notes, and you are free to download it, share it. It is in the public domain. So why am I here talking to you? Well, governments around the world spend $9.5 trillion um, every year on public procurement. This is public money. Um, you know, it's used for all things such as getting boots for armies, to pencils for different departments, uh, to roads, bridges, hospitals. It is all part of it. And if you were to, let's see if I have a $1 bill. I don't. So we're going to use, we're going to pretend that this is a $1 bill. So imagine if this was a $1 bill. If you stack these up, it would go to the moon and back. That is how much $9.5 trillion is. And yes, you can find the source for this if you read the speaker notes, so don't forget to do that. Why is it important? It's also important because it is the government's number one corruption risk. And 57% of foreign bribery cases for public contracts involved public procurement. So, you know, where there is a lot of, where there is big money and vested interests, of course, there's going to be a risk of corruption. This, which is why we need to investigate this data to hold power to account. And you know, it's not just in, in in certain parts of the world that there is there is corruption. You know, I often hear that misconception, but that's not true. You know, in fact, if you just look at um, the um, you know OECD countries, you will see that 20% of their budget is uh, used. Um, you know, up to 20% is used in public procurement. And the European Parliament found that corruption fraud uh, resulted in five billion um, euros um, every year. So that is what it costs the European economy economies. And there is no shortage of scandals when it comes to public procurement. So you know, here's a really good example from from the U.S. where um, you know from a Chicago's public schools program, which which looks after you know the city's most impoverished areas, um, usually housing people of color um, and uh, kids from poor backgrounds. And uh, someone in a position of power used her contacts with her former employers to get them uh, a twenty million dollar contract um, in in exchange for kickbacks. Then there is an example from London, where I'm based, uh, where we see that you know our property industry in the UK is very con very very um, controversial because it is in London specifically it is a harbor full of dirty money, and the rent prices uh, are are extortionate. So there is has been a lot of work um, done to see you know if there is any conflict of interest there. And there's a really interesting story about, about how many London councillors have links with the property industries. And then here's a really sad story from Nigeria about how the fight against uh, terrorism has been hindered because of, of shoddy contracts. And we, all, all, we always hear about um, ghost schools, but there's also the concept of ghost armies. And um, it, is, you know, it costs real lives. So why am I here and who am I? So Open Contracting Partnership is um, a silo-busting uh, collaboration across government, business, and civil society um, using technology and, and smart policies to really target public uh, contracting around the world. It started as a concept in the World Bank because the bank found that it was really hard to track um, some of their projects on, on the ground, which can be really complex, involve lots of parties, and they couldn't see how that money was being used and if there was any waste due to inefficiencies or corruption. So, you know, some change makers uh, and shakers and movers and shakers in the bank came together and um, they 
they started the Open Contracting Partnership and what would become the Open Contracting Deal Standard. And afterward, it spun out as an independent organization. We are, you know, about 15 people. We work all across the world. I am from Pakistan, but I'm based here in the UK. I have colleagues in Mexico, Colombia, in Ghana, in, in Lithuania, um, and, and our, we have office in DC as well. So what do we do? Well, as I said, we we connect government, business, and civil society. That is the three groups that we really care about because we want all of these groups to work together to open up and monitor public contracting for better outcomes for everyone. And how do we do this? We do this through advocacy. Um, you know, really getting governments to support this agenda, uh, working with civil society and business. We have a huge network of partners, including Finance Uncovered, who we're doing this collaboration with. Um, and, you know, we work on a political level to, ra to raise awareness about our open contract deal standard, which I will be talking about in a minute. And also sharing the learning from these different regions, which is also really important for this presentation because you'll see that I will um, cite examples from different countries that we worked in and that led to um, a very important piece of work around red flags. And here is, is an example of all the countries that we work with. And they're not just countries, they're, you know, subnational governments, there are cities. So, you know, all the way from like Argentina, to, to, to Scotland, um, Uruguay, and we've got some countries in Asia as well. We're working in Malaysia and Indonesia um, and Nepal. So lots of interesting work happening. You know, some places are more, uh, are doing more than others, but these are, these names are the countries that have committed to implementing the open contracting principles or data standard. Well, we're not. So, um, we are not replicating FOIA law. It's really important because um, often people think, well, you know, you have open contracting, so you don't need FOIA, or uh, we have FOIA, so we don't need open contracting. Not at all. These two things are separate, and um, they, you know, they are complementary. So, you know, open contracting is a, is a proactive disclosure um, framework, and, um, and nothing can replace FOIA. It is absolutely essential. Um, similarly, we are not in a procurement system. We don't sell uh, any system to the government. We don't advise them to use a particular system. What our idea standard is, is, is a structure, a map that they can follow, a best practice that they can uh, follow to uh, collect and publish better and monitor better uh, public procurement data. We are also not saying that there is no such thing as commercial sensitivity. However, and I will come back to this, there is a reason why a lot of uh, governments hesitate to publish uh, the contracts, which is why we did a research on this, and I'm going to explain why. Um, in most cases, you know, there, the argument of legitimate commercial sensitivity does not hold up. So Open Contract Data Center, also known as OCDS, because that is a very long name. So the OCDS is, um, it is a data standard. Um, it is a global data standard. It is, um, it is, it is open. It's free. You can check it out on standard.opencontracting.org. You can actually see the link in below in the speaker notes as well. And um, when we talk about open contracting, we think about the public procurement process as five stages. So you have the planning stage. That's where there is there is a user need to which the government is responding to. You know, there is a hurricane, so we need to uh, procure tents or you know shelter. That is. That would be the user research and that would be the need that the government is responding to. So there should be some documents, some data in the planning stage. Then we move on to the tender stage. And again, the tender stage, we know that this is where the government is putting it out and saying to the market that, um, you know, there is this money. There is here's what we want. Here's the specifications and, you know, apply. But there are different tender processes. So the government can also tender, you know, directly. So they already know who they want to give this contract to. It can be a closed process. It can be an open and competitive process where anyone can apply. It can be a semi-open process where there's um, a few preferred suppliers. And um, and and basically there's uh, also where it's open, but there are only one, one bid is received. So there's different ways of how ten the tender stage um, uh, can can show and then we go to the award stage where a government has selected a successful supplier and said this is 
is this or these are the suppliers because there can be multiple suppliers um, they will receive this money and then we move on to the contract stage where the government is um, you know writing up the actual legal document which will specify what is delivered for what what are the reporting requirements and um, and how what are the clauses now this is really important because many um, many contracts um, you know are uh, written very very well but then there are later on their contract amendments added to and that is where a lot of uh, shady deals can manifest themselves. So it's really important to monitor the contract uh, contracting stage. And then um, we come to implementation. So, you know, is the house built? Is the hospital standing? You know, were 500 brooms delivered? Um, what was the quality of them? These are the kind of things that come to the implementation stage. Now, in terms of these five stages, um, around the world we see there's a lot of information on the tender stage, the award stage. There is almost no information on the contract stage um, and then implementation there's some data available but usually there's not enough but governments are collecting it internally but they're not publishing it so in terms of the contract stage it's interesting to mention the case of Slovakia so Slovakia had so much problems when it came to um, having uh, you know corruption and efficiencies uh, in a really really old um, system that they, uh, they introduced a new law. And the law said that you can, a, a contract is not enforceable unless it is a public document. So that is the kind of like, that is the, the end, the, the best practice, the gold standard of how contract transparency should work. Um, that is not the case in most countries, uh, but there is procurement legislations, and we'll cover a bit more on that later. So these five stages are actually quite important, even if you are not looking at the DS standard. And I'll explain how you can use the DS standard. But conceptually, you know, when you're investigating a public procurement deal or a particular sector, let's say you're looking into defense contracts or health contracts, it's really uh, useful to think in terms of these five stages. So you divide all your leads, information into these stages. And also when you're writing stories around it, it's helpful to map, you know, well, at what stage was um, there a, a gap in public policy or, or, you know, what stage was there a fraud committed um, or what stage was there inefficiencies? Because sometimes it's not corruption, it's just bad management, like really, really bad management um, and how that could have been tackled. So a really, really important five-stage conceptual framework. So here's an example of some of the things that you will find in the data standards. So you can find things like documents. We already discussed the tender document, the planning document, you know, key dates, when was the tender released, when was it, um, when was the last day for, you know, submitting your bids, when was it awarded, the contract start date, end date, you know, uh, locations, where is supplier based, where is the buyer based? Where is the project site? Um, contract values, budgets, spendings, and you know, line items and classifications. So what is being procured? And there are some you know, national and also international classifications that can be included in it. And then milestones. So there are just some examples of what the DS standard is. And you can look at the DS standard and it'll make more sense when you do that. The DS standard is um, perhaps uh, open contracting's most um, well-known tool and um, there's a whole movement of users around it and the UK government has actually endorsed it as a as their official standard so it's interesting how they describe it as well so you know when you're talking about OCDS sometimes it's useful to just also show you know well here's the government is saying that officially this is the best way of presenting procurement data what we're not a software it's nothing to install it is not a licensed software or data standard either you don't have to pay anything it's free it's open source um, and it does not require governments to plug out everything and start by lots of new systems that is not what it's about it can work with existing systems depending on how good they are um, what it is 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 a map of collection and publishing and monitoring of, of, uh, of and the guidance that goes with it so a really good example of where we've seen impact in uh, in public procurement has been in Ukraine. 
And, you know, after the Maiden Revolution in 2014, the government was starting from scratch. So they used their in public procurement corruption was such a big problem. They had, and I'll tell you how bad it was in a second. Um, they, the, the perception of corruption uh, from businesses was really high. So, so the government and civil society and, and business, they really took the open contracting principles and data standard and built a procurement system around it called Prozoro. And it has to date saved you know, more than a billion US dollars um, for, for the Ukrainian government, uh, which is 1.4% of their GDP. And uh, corruption perception has halved. So in even the, the 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 quality of complaints that they get about you know why did I lose this contract or this wasn't right even that has improved so people are being more specific and when they're saying well actually there's a problem in this or can I get more explanation of why this happened which is quite important so their system went from wait for it this which is what most procurement authorities look like around the world unfortunately and to this. So you can see, and actually you can go and see it unless it's down for maintenance. You can go and see this uh, Prozora platform yourself. You can see how many procedures are happening, uh, which are the procuring entities. Um, you can see where they're based. Um, and there's actually a civil society platform uh, like it called Duzoro, which is all around pu public monitoring of Prozora contracts. And even um, their state-owned enterprises are publishing on Prozoro, which is a really big deal because state-owned enterprises usually get away with not publishing, um, you know, public uh, contracts. And they there's a definite risk of uh, conflict of interest because they're so institutionalized. So they they are there um, in Ukraine that is happening. And here's uh, another really heartwarming story from Colombia. So the city of Bogota. Um, has, um, you know, the population size is uh, almost as big as the country of Netherlands. And they have, um, their school meals program uh, gives uh, school meals to like hundreds of thousands of kids. And they found that their costs were really high. Um, and the quality of the meals wasn't there. So the, the education secretary for the city of Bogota, uh, she re and her team really took a look at it and they found that, well, you know, the, you can see uh, in the graph here that the, the price of a banana was, you know, almost double to what the government was paying when you compare it to market prices. So they looked and they found that actually there were only 14 suppliers that were you know, managing uh, more than, you know, like a 40, 50 million dollar contract. And um, they figured out from looking at the prices that there was some collusion going on there. And so they, you know, after a lengthy process, and you should really read the story, it's, 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 it's amazing. They managed to open up that market, increase the supplier base from 14 to 46. They have, you know, more delivery of meals. So they have 700,000 meals that are delivered every day. And that price fixing scandal, so they've had a saving of 45%, which is huge for um, a city of that size in, in a country where, um, you know, those savings can result in real benefits to, to people. But here we come to our favorite topic, which is what about the commercial confidentiality? So how many times have you heard, well, you know, we would publish contracts, but then, you know, we're not sure how businesses would feel about it. Governments often say that, um, you know, it would hurt their competitive advantage. What about their intellectual property? So we heard this so many times that we thought, you know what, we need to do a study to put this to rest. So and we generally wanted to see what was the arguments on, on inside. So we spoke to 70 experts from 20 countries and, you know, drum roll, <laughs> surprise, surprise, or no surprise, we found very little evidence uh, that suggests that, you know, there are some cases in which that, uh, that that argument of confidentiality does come, but we found that there are ways uh, for, for majority of contracts that just isn't the case. So this research is available online. You can download it. Where it's very useful for you is when you're running your stories and you want to say, and you know you get a quote and let's say you get a quote from the procurement authority or like the ministry and they're saying well you know we don't publish this information because people don't understand it or you know it's um 
it hurts the business interest, we're just protecting our businesses, then there's evidence in this guide and this research which can help you formulate those arguments around why that's not the case. And I'll give you examples. So let's go to this example. So the defense industry is almost always the most protected industry um, and most secretive part of government. Um, when it comes to you know defense ministry, however, um, Australia, which has a huge defense budget, found there is an institute uh, in Australia that looked at all the defense contracts, and it found only two point seven percent of all defense contracts, um, you know, were genuinely confidential. So you know, there's there's a really good um, case study for for saying why you know. The fact that not all contracts are going to be confidential, so that is not a very good argument for not disclosing them. So we go through the 10 myths. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll pick out one or two that might be useful. So there's one where, so there's, I've already discussed FOIA, so let's select something else. Um, this is a good one, which is around confidentiality clauses prohibit the disclosure of contracts. And um, it's really about how governments write contracts themselves. So there's some evidence there about how they're written um, and how that can be made better. There's another myth which is around, you know, well, we can't disclose contracts because there's confidential stuff IP in there. Um, and the example, the example to use there is, well, if you are Coca-Cola or your Kit Kat um, and you have a competitor like Pepsi or, or like Buena Chocolate and you, you know, Right, you have a lot of competitors uh, for you, but then you shouldn't be writing. You shouldn't be writing in the secret recipe, which makes Coca-Cola different from Pepsi, into the contract document. The contract document is not for that, you know. And if 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 that stuff is being written, then the way contracts are written need to be changed. What often happens is that contract, um, the procurement officers, you know, at some point will come up with a contract document, then the next contract, which is a similar one. Uh, will just be used, the, the old contract document will be used, a few things will be changed, and then the whole department keeps using the same template, and then over time it just ossifies, and you find that there's actually, there's a lot of stuff in there that, that just does not make sense, it just doesn't need to be there. Contract docu documents should be simpler. And um, so we have a good example from the UK where the government digital services looked at its, um, how contracts were you know, being written in their own uh, department and they found that um, they locked some lawyers uh, into a room and they found that to read a contract it would take you know nine hours without any bathroom breaks and uh, over a week they cut and pasted and then figured out like you know how to make this simpler and they found lots of things which had no like use of being in, in a contract um, they, they took things out and they found that they were able to reduce it down to three hours so you know think about the cost of to small businesses about having like long, lengthy bureaucratic documents and not just like contract documents, their tender documents are similar as well. We've discussed the national security one and you can see here's one from about competition. So people all say that, well, you know, if we release more information, then less, you know, less companies are going to apply because um, it's, you know, they're gonna be like, oh, all these other companies have applied, have been successful. But actually that evidence like on the ground shows that's not the case in the countries that, certainly in the countries that open contracting is active. We found that competition actually increases. We've seen that in, you know, in the examples I just gave you around Ukraine and Colombia, you saw that there too. Um, so, you know, that really does not hold up. So this is the one that, that always gets me. Um, is that no one actually reads contracting documents and information, and if they do, they don't really understand, or you know, they'll just use it for political purposes. I hear this all the time from governments, and this is always directed towards journalists and society. So um, I just, yeah, this, I just, I, I'm always left for, with with no with no words and no response when I hear that because it's just, it's just a very um, weak argument because well, one there has to be public scrutiny when there is public spending. Secondly, if if you 
are collecting and publishing and organizing your data in such a way with no contextual information, then of course people are going to not understand it. Um, you, that means you just have to make it better. And thirdly, you know, if you um, if people don't have any information, then they're more likely to jump at straws and and make incorrect inferences. It happens to me all the time when I'm investigating something uh, or helping a journalist with a story and something looks really suspicious on paper and then you ask around, you ask procurement authorities and then they can explain it to you and then you realize actually it was just a misunderstanding. We didn't understand that part of the data set. But you know, if there that isn't even an option to see that, you know, there will be no learnings and there will be no feedback between um, civil society or you know data users and data publishers. And we have five principles on how this information can be made public. Um, you can read them. They're actually based on these five principles. They have been expanded by the Center for Global Development, and they're really, really good. I really recommend you read um, their like expanded set as well. Um, so, for instance, they've got that you know when, when a case by case reduction uh, approach is used, then you should explain to people, you know, what what was the reason uh, and how that can be appealed. So let's come to the main bit, which is common red flags and how do you find them? So this, um, as I mentioned, the this has been. We have a guide that has been put together, uh, which looks at 150 suspicious behavior indicators or red flags. And you can read the guide uh, there. It looks at different um, specific like data points and gives examples from, from our field work. Um, but here's the most important thing. I'm not going to cover all of them. I'm going to give you the main ones. And also remember that this red flags will look different for each industry, sometimes for each industry and for each country. Um, so, you know, you are the best place to understand what are the red flags for your region. So use what I'm giving you, what I'm, what I'm explaining as like the broad set of some common red flags. But, you know, there will be some local ones that, that are just not here or things that just don't work in your context, and, and that's okay. So again, we start with our basics. Remember that there are five stages for public procurement, and corruption can happen in every single one of that stage. So here's a really useful um, table, which can give you some of the main ones. So there's one around um, key planning documents not being provided. Um, or when you see the supplier address, when you go to the award stage, the supplier address, and you see, well, there are three suppliers and they all have the same address, or they're all, you know, they're all registered with the same lawyers. And then you start digging and then you can see, well, actually, it's part of the same company. So there might be some collusion going on. So there's um, that, that kind of stuff is really interesting. Or you can see that there, when you look in the implementation stage, you see that there has been contract amendments, which which substantially changes the nature of the contract. So the tender was for five million for let's say seven hundred units of like some um, some sort of uh, medical equipment, and then you realize that actually there was a contract amendment added. And instead of seven hundred, you're only delivering three hundred, and 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 some extra like free lessons or some like awareness raising activities. So that makes you think, okay, well, why was that change done? Um, so these are the kind of things that you should like scrutinize. And now I'm going to go through some of the big ones. So if you look at, when you look at fraud, in this slide you see at the top, it is, you know, what is the fraud that's happening? And then it goes to how do you find it? So when a company has no history in providing a service or product, and we have come across examples where there are companies that are delivering milk and then suddenly they're also like software providers, stuff like that. <laughs> or there is um, a winning supplier that submits a substantially lower bid than others. So you should, for this information you will need, you will for this you need to have information around supplier bids. Now this is really hard to find. Most countries do not publish uh, bidding information, which is a huge problem. In fact, we're doing a lot of advocacy around it is really important to have this because otherwise there's no way of knowing who applied, who lost, what were the bid prices. Or when you see, you know, you look at the, uh, when you look at the fact that the bid is too close to the price estimate. So it's like, you know, did, was someone tipped off before? How did they, how are they so accurate? 
for collusion, again, bid prices are really important. So this is perhaps where some fire is really important because you will not get this in open data sets um, or tip offs. So, you know, what is the difference between the bid prices? Is it an exact percentage? That's that makes you suspicious. Or you look at, you know, if um, who what is what is the what is the larger market? How many players are in there? And then you look at well, actually, but there are only five major players that are getting all the contracts instead of the instead of the larger market. This is a good one to, uh, to keep in mind for management consultancies. So the big five audit firms, accountancy firms. Um, and any sort of like consultancy providers, that is something that we see there that happens a lot. And it's really good to do an analysis on on there. And sometimes what they do is they will come work with the government um, on a free basis. So they're providing a service for free. They're giving 500 kids laptops. Um, and that information you will find in like press releases. You will not find the procurement data because no money was exchanged. And then suddenly, or or you see that they are doing a research for free for a particular ministry, um, and then or a department. And again, it's for free, so you don't see anything there. Um, but then suddenly, you start seeing the same management consultancy starts doing other contracts that are paid for contract, and then slowly their amounts start bl like blooming, and and suddenly they're like the main supplier for not only that department or ministry and they start taking over the central government or your local government. So important to look at the supplier like concentration there. There's actually a name for this practice and I, I forget the name. Bid rigging. So um, really interesting graph that you see by The Economist which is looking at single bids. Um, and you can see that the, the, the single bids are rising across Europe. And this is an interesting example because it's looking at Europe um, and people, you know, as I said before, people often think that corruption uh, only happens in, in, in quote unquote, the third world, but it doesn't, it really happens everywhere. And um, single bids have a direct correlation with, um, with like, you know, risk of corruption. So there's really interesting research done by um, some academics uh, in Cambridge um, and Sussex University in the UK looking at that. Um, and um, there, there's a link to that in the speaker notes as well. So, you know, when you're looking at uh, bid rigging, you want to see what kind of process. Remember when we discussed the type of tender processes? So is was it a direct award? Was it like a limited pool of suppliers that were preferred or pre-selected, uh, was it a direct award? You know, that is something to scrutinize, especially the use of direct award. Direct awards are very helpful tools for governments in an emergency. You know, they have a natural disaster or there is a very, very niche thing that they need and only one or two suppliers can do that and they have already procured from that. So there might be a, re there might be a good justification for them to go do that. It is not a good practice for everyday procurement because it closes off the market to new suppliers, especially smaller and like more diverse suppliers. So definitely one to watch. Um, then the other thing is looking at multiple award contract winners. Now that itself is not suspicious when you have a contract is being shared by a couple of parties, that's not suspicious. However, thinking about, you know, again, like thinking about the systematically, you know, who are the top suppliers and then seeing, well, do they keep winning the contracts? Um, why is it? So the repeat contractors, um, you know, looking at that would be, and this is one, one thing that I find always in my public events that, like citizens and residents are very interested in is like why they keep hearing the same names again in construction, in um, in auditing, um, private security, you name it. You know, they're like, why is the same company getting this contract again and again? And then we go to fixing the plan. So this is again the planning stage. So, you know, is the eligibility criteria uh, for setting company written in such a way that it only applies to this one um, organization so that is one um, one to see the other would be looking at you know so this is actually an example here from the UK in which the neutral decommissioning authority were were fined um, by the UK High Court 
or looking at you know whether the what time is the tender issued um this is a hilarious example from slovenia where um you know where half of the contracts that were issued uh just before the week before christmas only got one bid duh um but you would be surprised you would be surprised how many contracts are like like put out for tender around these times so definitely pay attention to the dates and also look at like how long companies had to apply if it's like a 7 million con- dollar contract and they only have 10 days to apply and there's no seemingly like re- there's no obvious reason for why it's an emergency i i would be suspicious and i, w- I would investigate more more information can be you know you think about you know whether the information was shared before so a company you know had a month in advance to prepare their pitch and their bed and that's really good or you know that there's um, this example from Slovakia where uh, it's, it is an extreme example where there was a um, 120 euro like you know 120 million euro tender was advertised in a in a like a building that was closed off to the public and it was i think in the in a corridor and i think it was in a basement um and that's where it was advertised so and remember this is the same country that i said that ha- that has that, that really good law about the enforceability of contracts or when you think when we look at collusion or cartels that you know again you think you hear cartels and you think oh we're talking about Latin america but no i am not the example here is for you know the european commission finding cartels in in the european market um and finding 1.9 billion euros in fines in 2017 and then thinking about fixing awards so uh, we heard about the example from chicago public schools so when you're awarding contracts with a clear conflict of interest this is the one which i think is is you can find in almost any jurisdiction so this is where you're building relationship maps and influence maps who knows who who's related to who um and you know people often like really focus on the procurement officers which is i think you know of course that this part of the puzzle but don't just stop there think about you know who is you know who sits above the procurement officer who is the head of the ministry or the department who are who is the minister and you think you have to think about all of these and here's where some social media sleuthing can be um pretty handy and there are lots of great tools that allow you to to build those maps or when you as we discussed you know direct awards that that is pretty suspicious as well um it doesn't always mean there is something going on but it definitely deserves some scrutiny and then to the last stage which is the implementation you know is the school there was this delivered was this made what quality was it so we discussed uh contract amendments really important really hard to find out because they're not published because contracts are not published so unless there's a new story around it or you have a tip off it's harder to find but it is you know um it is something to file and or turning a blind blind eye to bad uh implementation and there's some really harrowing examples where bridge bridges have fall, fallen you know um in china uh, schools killed kids because they fell on top of them after the earthquake and because they were built with really bad materials um in romania people died because the the disinfectant was so watered down that it just didn't work so you know there is all of these things that we're talking about have have a cost not just in terms of um money but in terms of real lives um and um it's really important to which is why this is this is why we're doing all of this right this is why we're talking about this um but i have a warning and the warning is a red flag does not mean that there is corruption I really i cannot emphasize this enough um you know you start looking at something and when you look at the data it looks really suspicious but then you start digging you start asking a few people um and you figure out that actually it's just you just didn't understand it or the data was incomplete and it's actually not suspicious at all so um it's these are just flags and they are leads for you to then do more like traditional journalism around finding out whether these are actual uh, flags or not I'm going to talk about some data sources and tools that you can use to find these leads um you know using the frameworks we've discussed so um 
you know, the, the real ground truth is that we, um, a lot of this data is not available as open data. So that means you probably will be scraping it um, or using something like Jupyter Notebooks um, to you know, sort of analyze very large data sets if the data is available. We actually are building some Jupyter Notebooks so you, you know, keep your eyes on our Twitter and join our Slack community and then you'll get notified when, when those are released. Um, you can also use the open contracting data standard to investigate. So remember when I said that it's like a map and a structure? So we have documentation of what that structure is. So it's helpful because it becomes like a lingua franca for procurement data. So all those like 40 countries that have pledged, you know, and those of whom are actually publishing, you can then compare and contrast their data and you understand the structure. But irrespective of whether that is released or not, once you get your hand on procurement data, as I said before, you start organizing it using the open contract data and the benefit of that is and then you can use our community and our team built tools to analyze and visualize that data and they're all free and they're all open source so you can really leverage that um, and then of course good old-fashioned FOIA where can you find it you can find them on national portals on you know the there's usually uh, national portals, sometimes there are regional portals as well. So for the European Union, you have TED, Tenders Electronic Daily. Um, there is also a debarred companies list for um, that is available at the World Bank and some of the other multilaterals. Um, countries that are funded through these, um, projects that are funded through these um, banks usually have to maintain those and publish them somewhere. They're usually PDFs, but they're available. There's also like UN related uh, lists, which you can see here. Um, and then importantly, if you're working on extractive industries, the EITI, the Extractives Industry Transparency Initiative, they uh, get countries um, to disclose payments from uh, sort of like from extractive contracts, including beneficial ownership, which is amazing. You know, beneficial ownership is who is the true owner uh, or controller who benefits from a from a business, um, and that is the, these are the, the real people, you know, with power. So that is what is disclosed in this data set. So do look at the EITI data, um, and then of course there are other like Panama Papers, our offshore databases. There's an investigative dashboard by ICIJ, and I'm going the example I'm giving here are actually all from the UK. But this is just to get you thinking about how contracting data set is like a fundamental data set that links into other data sets. So if you're looking at company information, actually you can go to open corporates because it is the world's largest open registry of company information. They're very, I used to work there, they're very journal, journalist friendly and they, um, you can search everything online anyway, but if you sign up for an account, which is free, um, you can see more information, but also they have an API. So if you email them and sign up for the journalist API, you can get access to a lot more data. Beneficial ownership, you can look at open ownership, which collects EITI data and then any other national um, beneficial ownership uh, data sets like from Denmark and the UK. You can also look at spending. So OpenOps is the largest publisher of open contracting data standard. So they collect all the sort of open contracting data sets from around the world and put them in one place. They also have a journalism plan. So just email them and they'll give you access to their dashboard. Uh, which will help you just write very quick queries and you see without having to code anything. Um, and so they just have to email them to get a journalist access. Um, and then for the UK, there's grants data from 360 Giving. It's, and the reason I mention this is because often we, when you think about public money and contracting, we only think about businesses, but that's not the case. You know, charities also receive money from governments as, you know, for delivering social services, um, and sometimes grants. So both of them also deserve scrutiny. And then land registry. So if you wanted to, again, build a better map of assets, you can look at um, what um, land is owned by certain companies or government contractors. And as I mentioned before, EU tenders, you can look at opentenders.eu. That is not the TED website that I mentioned before, but what this does is it's it was made by academics um, and civil society and it helps you visualize um, and search the EU tenders. And they have a whole integrity matrix as well, which is very user-friendly. 
So what next? You have heard this presentation. What do you do? Well, one is I want to see that you feel that, you know, public procurement is not a boring data set. It is a very interesting. When I joined Open Contracting, I was like, well, I'm not sure how exciting this, this you know, um, like working on procurement data is going to be, but it is riveting, um, though with sometimes with lots of dead ends, but it's really important that we, you know, look into this and hold people to account um, and, and see where public spending is going. So make public procurement your favorite data set. Um, look at what is the public procurement law for your region, at what are the thresholds at which the government has to disclose information, especially sometimes there's a different um, data set for spending and different for tenders and then contracts. So just think about what is available. Look at, build a list of what information you can get internationally and locally. Set up a database to import that data or just use Excel. Again, think about the open contract data standard or even just the five categories that we mentioned, you know, for public procurement, five stages. Make a better FOIA request based on these leads that you find from open data sets. And then let us know if you've written a cool story. So um, we, we have a technical help desk, which is free for publishers if you're working on a big story. Um, then we can help you with answering some questions of or something you don't understand. So you can just email the info address. And uh, also we have, a, we're happy to talk about, you know, uh, and give you um, statements and quotes about um, what is wrong with a given like uh, procurement law or system and who's doing it well and how countries can be more transparent. And finally, join our Slack community. It's a really easy way to get in touch with uh, people at our team and also in our wider network. We, we, we speak to journalists around the world and it's a great place to, to have um, you know, a great safe space to ask questions. And that's it. So I just really would like to thank you for um, to Finance Uncovered for giving me this opportunity to talk to you and present this. Um, Remember, the slide deck is completely open. You can share it, use it, um, and um, also use it to deliver trainings yourself. So um, very happy for you to take ownership of it. It is a community resource. We are very, you know, we uh, at Open Contracting, we are very passionate about uh, helping journalists tell better stories um, and hold people to account, not just about corruption, but about just bad procurement, you know, badly designed run procurement, because all of these things have a real human impact. And um, we, we should not be, we should not be having this conversation. There is enough best practice out there that countries can start, um, you know, investigating, but for many reasons, including vested interests, um, that progress just hasn't happened. So, um, Really excited to see what stories you come up with. Uh, don't forget to get in touch and tell us what you're doing. Um, you saw my email and uh, Open Contracting's email and Twitter handle at the beginning, and we're also available on Slack. So um, uh, see you online.